Hello and welcome to this conversation with Chris. And this is actually a continuation and a, a bit of a deviation um, and convergence with the what we've been doing together in terms of reading the Platonic Dialogues. We're going to switch over um, and uh, and take a sidetrack and read on the way to language by Martin Heidegger. And uh, the first chapter in that book is a dialogue between basically Heidegger and a student whose professor was a student of Heidegger. Um, and so this will, we'll be diving into it just like we were reading the other dialogues. Um, so Chris is, he's gonna be the Japanese person and I will be, I'll be Heidegger. And then we'll read, experience it, and then come to terms with what is, uh, what is, what is being released from the letters, if you so, so to speak. Um, some few housekeeping things: the uh, art of circling. Uh, the main uh, thing that I teach from the Circling Institute is open for registration. Link for that is below. We have open weekends. All of this stuff is online now. Um, link for that is below. And we have uh, drop-in evening events every Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, uh, California time. And uh, you go to the Facebook page to see all of that stuff and to the, to the uh, website page. So all that's below. If you're interested in working one-on-one -on -one with me in coaching, uh, please email me. My emails below. All right, enjoy. This was, I mean, this conversation was so, actually the conversation was so fun and flowing and revealing. And there was that sense in which we were taking, at some point, we, we started to, something started to come to salience for Chris and I, and then we, as we started to talk about it, we brought in a lot of the, um, distinctions and ideas that we've been already talking about and kind of ran it like um uh went into dot like brought into dialectic and and i think something is still kind of wiggling wiggling out of out, like rolling around in our heads that's um so interesting how what we were thinking or what was being thought in some way can be revealed through taking up the thinking of someone else. More of your own thought can be revealed to you. You know, in this case, basically Plato, Platonic, right, through, Heide through this dialogue with Heidegger, kind of running through that. So it's like, it's, it's, it's interesting, the, the fractal nature of all this. Go figure. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Guy. Mm -hmm. So happy to get, be on your screen. Is I yes, happy to find myself on yours, <laughs> right? That uh, so we're we're taking a, shall we say, after having read Alcibiades, now we're going to now read a dialogue, actually a rare in this form dialogue with Heidegger and a I believe it's. I'm sure somebody will probably correct me on this if, if this is inaccurate, but I believe it's it's a it's a it's a it's a conversation that I think actually happened that Heidegger went back and rewrote. Um, mm -hmm. But it's basically between a a Japanese student of a professor that was um, that that Heidegger was a teacher of. Right, so it's basically like the Japanese student is of a professor in Japan, right? Of somebody that, whose his teacher was somebody that Heidegger taught, right? Um, and that's kind of the basis of the conversation they're and they're talking. So I think you'll be the the Japanese student, and I will be. Um, it, he just calls himself the Inquirer, but I think it's Heidegger. You can think of it as Heidegger. Okay. Yeah. And, and why I wanted to do this was, I'm not exactly sure why I wanted to do this other than it kind of called out. Um, however, the, 
I, I think mostly I'm interested in just engaging in this with you, given that we've been elucidating dialogos in such a, 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 a platonic, right, from Plato and, and Socrates and all that stuff. It'd just be really, I thought it'd be really interesting to whatever way it contrasts and thus elucidates, mm -hmm. right, this, um, the platonic dialogues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're used to reading in the manner of Socrates. Yeah. And I, and I think we're probably going to start again reading in the manner of Socrates, but I imagine yeah. that as we get further and further along, we're going to find that the manner changes. You're right. And that actually yeah. it's been Socrates speaking the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this, for me, this is about as cold as a read gets. I've not read this in advance, so this will be fun. And, okay, great. Uh, apologies in advance for all the, all all the right. shoddy Japanese pronunciations I'm about to utter. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. You know Count Shuzokuki? He studied with you for a number of years. Count Kukuki has a lasting place in my memory. He died too early. His teacher, Nishida, wrote his epitaph. For over a year, he worked on, his, on the supreme tribute to his pupil. I am happy to have photographs of Kukuki's grave and of the grove in which it lies. Yes, I know the temple garden in Kyoto. Many of my friends often join me to visit the tomb there. The garden was established toward the end of the 12th century by the priest Honen on the eastern hill of what was then the imperial city of Kyoto as a place for reflection and deep meditation. And so... The temple grove remains the fitting place for him who died early. Hmm. All his reflection was devoted to what the Japanese call a key. In my dialogue with Kukuki, I never had more than a distant inkling of what that word says. Okay, pause right there. Um, so it's interesting. I almost said misread it as means, but he says that that word says. I'm just, I just want to highlight that because I think that there's, it's interesting to think about when we speak of what a word says versus mm. what a word means, mm, mm. right? I think there's a, it shows a disposition towards the word that's different than, yeah. right? Yeah, it's Showing. like the French, the, what the French call the difference between long and parole, the, uh, the utterance as opposed to the, 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 the linguistic token of the speech as opposed to its utterance, something yeah. like that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Later, after his return from Europe, Count Kuki gave lectures in Kyoto on the aesthetics of Japanese art and poetry. These lectures have come out as a book. In the book, he attempts to consider the nature of Japanese art with the help of European aesthetics. But in such an attempt, may we turn to aesthetics? Why not? The name aesthetics and what it, what it names grows out of European thinking, out of philosophy. Consequently, aesthetic consideration must ultimately remain alien to the East Asian thinking. You are right, no doubt. Yet we Japanese have to call on aesthetics to aid us. With what? Aesthetics furnishes us with the concepts to grasp what is of concern to us as art and poetry. Hmm. Do you need concepts? Presumably, yes. Because since the encounter with European thinking, there has come to light a certain incapacity in our language. In what way? It lacks the delimiting power to represent objects related in an unequivocal order above and below each other. Hmm. Do you seriously regard this incapacity as a deficiency of your language? Considering that the encounter of the East Asian with the European world has become inescapable, your question certainly calls for searching reflection. Here, 
you are touching on a controversial question, which I often discuss with, often, dis, often discussed with Count Kuki. The question whether it is necessary and insightful for Eastern, Easterners, East Asians, to chase after the European conceptual systems. In the face of modern tech, uh, technicalization and industrialization of every continent, there would seem to be no escape any longer. You speak cautiously. You say, would seem. Indeed. For the possibility still always remains that, seen from the point of view of our East Asian existence, the technical world which sweeps us along must confine itself to surface matters. And that? That, for this reason, a true encounter with European existence is still not taking place, in spite of all assimilation and intermixtures. Perhaps cannot take place. Can we assert this so unconditionally? I would be the last to venture it, else I should not have come to Germany. But I have a constant sense of danger with Count Cookie too, could obviously not overcome. What danger are you thinking of? That we will let ourselves be led astray by the wealth of concepts which the spirit of the European languages has in store and will look down upon what claims our existence as on something that is vague and amorphous. Yet a far greater danger threatens. It concerns both of us. It is all the more menacing just by being more inconspicuous. How? The danger is threatening from a region where we do not suspect it and which is yet precisely the region where we would have to experience it. You have then experienced it already. Otherwise you could not point it out. I am far from having experienced the danger to its full extent but I have sensed it in my dialogues with Count Kuki. So, so, so right there, I just wanna like, I just wanna highlight something. So here we are, there's this danger and we're like, I can get this sense of like, we're walking around, like we're walk, talking about this danger, but we don't know yet what the danger is. In fact, in fact, there's, there's even this kind of move where he says, like, he's like, well, I, I've lived it, but I haven't really lived it, mm. right? So I just, there's, there's this way in which the dialogue, I get the sense of like, we're, we're walking around that something, right? But to name it, there is a sense in which there's, it seems like there's a sensibility that it wouldn't be appropriate. It wouldn't be revealing and naming it, right? Which may be actually the pointing to the danger that he's talking about, right? I can't, I can't, we, so before we started recording, you and I were just talking about something very similar, weren't we? Mm-hmm. We were talking about the, the nominalization or denominalization of a world yeah. that one kind of slinks into unknowingly and can become enveloped by. Like as and, in a dream. And like as in a dream and inculcated by without, without being aware of it. And that waking up from such a dream becomes really the project of wisdom, Mm -hmm. at least in the Socratic tradition. Mm -hmm. And there's, you and I, um, you and I spoke of the dangers of being unable to wake up from such a dream and how dialogos as a practice is a way of augmenting the dream so as to wake up in it lucidly and then begin to probe it. Right. right in that in almost like Jung's sense of active imagination. So we were talking about all of this before we actually started reading yeah. and how such a dream can become a worldview that attunes your normativity without, without you realizing that that's precisely what's happening to you, right? When right. everything you are doing, when all of your behavior begins to presuppose it, at what point 
did it become your presupposition? And that is a, a, like, it's a deep, deep existential danger that we were talking about. And I'm not, I don't want to presume that that's exactly what's being referred to here, but there is an interesting little, there's something a bit synchronistic about the fact that we were just talking about the dangers, the dangers of a world that becomes axiomatic beneath your attention and then constitutes your attention. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And so, and and that being the basis of, of ideology and ideological thinking is that which guides your attention being, um, being unframable with your attention. Right. And that being a great danger. Right. Yeah. And you were also talking about this and it's, it's a, it, it, you're also talking about when you're, you, you kind of wake up within a dream and it's a lucid dream mm-hmm. that you're talking about this boundless freedom that becomes of you, but also this delicacy of you could easily fall f- too far forward and, and lose track that you're dreaming or yeah. you, if you're too self-conscious, right? Like and you break you'll the wake spell. up. There's you the, break the spell. this sweet spot. And we kind of talked about that like I, I think I referenced the, the the sense of you know symbolically that sense that um, who is it uh, the theologian the modern theologian um, are you talking about Tillich, Tillich yeah Tillich yeah. you know it says the human being is the tension between participation yeah. and individuation and individuation that's right, right? Yeah. so I hear the echoes in that here so it's just interesting like this sense of this sense of a an awareness of that there's something to be respected, right? Yet we must participate with it in such a way that we don't, we don't um, insert, right? And wake up from it, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? And we don't just get lost in it. So it's like the, almost like the, 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 the stru- perhaps the structure of the conversation is demonstrating that, but it's also what they're talking about. That's right. So it's very much that oh, interesting. It's very much that same thing we were talking I, about I, earlier. It might be. It might be. It might be. Time, we'll I think ta- ta- time and, and further reading will tell. But yeah, we'll I can't help if... but notice the resemblance, at least at this moment. Yeah, totally. Well, if it's not, then we can definitely say Heidegger didn't think of it, you know. Metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you say that. Right, exactly. Um, okay, where were we to see? Uh, um, I, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just, you ha- I'll just start. I'll, yeah. Okay. Did you speak with it, with him about it? No, the danger arose from the dialogues themselves in that they were dialogues. I do not understand what, what you mean. Our dialogues were not formal scholarly discussions. Whenever, oh, I'm sorry, we we swapped without realizing oh, it, guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that that walk was funny. Hey, let's just start from the top. Um, that's so, that's a, top of the page. You mean, right? Yeah, yeah. So Four? You start. Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. <laughs> see, see what you mean about flitting into a different world and uh, not abs- realizing it right away. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> You have then experienced it already. Otherwise, you could not point it out. I am far from having experienced the danger to its full extent. But I have sensed it in my dialogues with Count, um, Count Kuki. Did you speak with him about it? No. The danger arose from the dialogues themselves in that they were dialogues. I do not understand what you mean. Our dialogue were not formal scholarly discussions. Whenever that sort of thing seemed to be taking place, as in the seminars, Count Kuki remained silent. The dialogues of which I am taught, I am thinking, came about at my my house, like a spontaneous game. Count Kuki occasionally brought his wife along who then wore festive Japanese garments. 
They made the Eastern world more luminously present and the danger of our dialogues became more clearly visible. Interesting. Oh, that is interesting. I still do not understand what you mean. The danger of our dialogues was hidden in the language itself, not in what we discussed, nor in the way in which we tried to do so. But Count Cookie had uncommonly good command of German and of French and English, did he not? Sorry, my, my, my ear fell out. Um, I'll take the line again. But okay. Count Cookie had uncommonly good command of German and of French and English, did he not? Of course. He could say in European languages, whatever was under discussion. But we were discussing a key. I, it's just for, for people watching, it's, it's pronounced, or it's, it's spelled I-K-I, Ike. And here, it was I to whom the spirit of the Japanese language remained closed, as it is to this day. The languages of the dialogue shifted everything into European. Yet the dialogue tried to say the essential nature of East Asian art and poetry. Now I am beginning to understand better where you smell the danger. The language of the dialogue constantly destroyed the possibility of saying what the dialogue was about. Some time ago, I called, I called language, clumsily enough, the house of being. If man by virtue of his language dwells within the claim and call of being, then we Europeans presumably dwell in an entirely different house than Eastern Asian man. Assuming that the languages of the two are not merely different, but are other in nature, and radically so. And so, a dialogue from house to house remains nearly impossible. You are right to say nearly, for still it was a dialogue, and I should think an exciting one, because Count Kuki and the workshops he held with us at Kyoto University came back again and again to those dialogues with you. Most often it happened when we pressed him in our effort to understand more clearly the reason that had prompted him at the time to go to Germany and study with you. Your book, Being in Time, had, not, had then not yet been published. But after the First World War, several Japanese professors, among them our revered Professor Tanabe, went to Husserl in Freiburg to study phenomenology with him. That is how my compatriots came to know you in person. It was just as you said. In those days, I and Hersler, Hersler's assistant regularly once a week read Hersler's first major work, The Logical Investigations, with the gentleman from Japan. By that time, the master himself no longer held his work in very high esteem. It had been published around the turn of the century, but I had my own reasons to prefer the logical investigations for the purposes of an introduction to phenomenology, and the master generously tolerated my choice. And I believe, just for, just for some context, I believe, if I understand this right, at some point, Hersler like totally went into the, like, uh, kind of making his work circle around like a, a, a transcendental subject, right? Um, and his earlier work, which is what I think Heidegger was referencing, um, was, was less so. It was before... Mm -hmm. The, the Cartesian transcendental kind of subject. And that's kind of, I think, was the break that he had mm -hmm. with, with, okay. uh, with, yeah. with Hersler, yeah. In case that's yeah, okay. relevant. 
that's yeah, that's good context. Uh, at the time, I believe it was in 1921, our professors attended the cl a class you gave. They brought a transcript of it back to Japan. The title, if I'm not mistaken, was Expression and Appearance. That, in any event, was the title of the course. Yet Professor Kuki must have had his special reason for coming to me in Marburg. Marburg. Indeed, and I believe these reasons trace back to that course, whose transcript was also much discussed elsewhere in Japan. Transcripts are muddy sources, of course. What is more, the course was most imperfect. Yet, there was quickening in it the attempt to walk a path of which I did not know where it would lead. I knew only the most immediate short range perspectives along that path because they beckoned me unceasingly while the horizon shifted and darkened more than once. My compatriots must indeed have sensed some of that. Again and again, it was said that your questions circled around the problem of language and of being. In fact, this was not too difficult to discern, for as early as 1915, the title of my dissertation, Dus Scotus, Doctrine it's of... Duns Dun Scotus. Duns Scotus, yes. I was saying it in the German. Um, <laughs> uh, doctrine of categories and theory of meaning. The two perspectives came into view. Doctrine of categories is the usual name of the discussion of the being of beings. Theory of meaning means the um, grammatica speculativa, the metaphysical reflection on language in its relation to being. But all these relationships were then still unclear to me. Which is why you kept silent for 12 years. And I dedicated being and time, which apparently in 1927 to Herschel, Herschler became phenomenology, because phenomenology presented us with the possibility of a way. Still, it seems to me that the fundamental theme, language and being, stayed there in the background. It did stay there, even in the course you mentioned of 1921. The same held true also of the question of poetry and of art. In those days of expressionism, these realms were constantly before me, but ever more, and already since my student days before the First World War, was the poetic work of Holdren and Trackle. And still earlier, during my last years in the gymnasium, to give a date, in the summer of 1907, I came up against the question of being in the dissertation on Herschler's teacher's Franz um, Brentano. Its title is On the Manifold Meaning of Being According to Aristotle. It dates from 1862. The book came to me as a gift from my fatherly friend and fellow um, Swabian Dr. Conroy Grober, later to become Archbishop of, of um, Friesburg, Fres Freeburg. Then he was um, Visser of Trinity Church in Constance. Do you still have the book? Here it is for you to look at. I'm sorry. Here it is for you to look at and to read the inscription which runs, quote, my first guide through Greek philosophy in my gymnasium days, unquote. I'm telling you all this 
but not in order to give the impression that I already knew then everything I am still asking today. But perhaps there is confirmation here for you, who, as a professor of German literature, love and know Holdren's work particularly well, of a phrase of that poet, which begins in the fourth stanza of the hymn, The Rhine. For as you began, you will remain. The quest of language and of being is perhaps a gift of that light ray which fell on you. Who would have the audacity to claim that such a gift has come to him? I only know one thing. Because reflection on language and on being has determined my path of thinking from early on. Therefore, discussion has stayed as far as possible in the background. The fundamental flaw of the book, Being in Time, is perhaps that I ventured forth too far too early. Oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. you know, what's, in what's interesting about that for you? I'm not sure I know. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm not I sure know, I know. Because I know. I mean, it's a. It's a. It's. It's a. It's the big talk, in kind of Heideggerian philosophy, thing that I've heard a lot, which is, where, it's presumed that Heidegger. And and you can kind of get it here, right? Where he's basically saying, no, Heidegger, like being in time, was kind of a mistake. I started it and I, the very thing that I, I was attempting to um, transcend, I, I presupposed in transcending, I got caught in the thing I was trying to leave. Mm. But my understanding is, is that since, since his, um, his whole corpus is, or a lot more of his, of Heidegger's writings, which is like 120 books, basically, insane amount of, <laughs> insane amount of, of writing. Um, you can start to see, people are starting to speak of that. No, actually you can kind of see that, no, it's, it, was, it was not his thought, but being that turned, right? That it was like, you couldn't have, you know, they call it like Heidegger number one and Heidegger number two, um, some people, right? And he's like, and Heidegger said like, look, okay, you can call it that, but as, all, as long as you can, you can say that Heidegger number two is predicated on Heidegger number one and is, in, is contained within it and co-contained with each other, right? So mm. it's, it's, a much, it's much more rich and, and complex than, than just a mistake, right? Mm. Right? It was a net, if anything, it was a, if you want to look at it as a mistake, it was a necessary mistake that revealed, right, the ground that he necessarily assumed didn't notice that he was assuming was there. So such that when he stepped off it, he mm. got to see that it wasn't there and thus. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So by somehow by over transcribing the being of which he wrote, he realized that the work was in identical with it. Yeah, totally. And so could find his way back to it. Yep. Yep. Almost ironically. Yep. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you for that little sojourn into Heidegger guy. You, uh, yeah, that was good. Mm -hmm. Sweet. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, the, the sojourn into the historical Heidegger. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, totally. obviously that's what we're doing. Yes. Absolutely. Um, okay. So why don't you go ahead and start on, on, on the top of page eight? Oh, right. There we go. Uh, that can hardly be said of your thoughts on language. True, less so, for it was all of 20 years after my doctoral dissertation that I dared discuss in a class the question of language. It was at that same time that I, in class, made public my first interpretation of Holdren's hymns in, this, in the summer semester of 1934. I offered a lecture series under the title logic. 
In fact, however, it was a reflection on the logos in which I was trying to find the nature of language. Yet it took nearly another 10 years before I was able to say what I was thinking. <laughs> the pain. <laughs> the pain. <laughs> I love that. It's a great sleight of hand, yeah. right? I offered a lecture series under the title Logic. In fact, however, it was a, re it was a reflection on the logos yeah. in which I was trying to find the nature of language. It's, uh, it's almost like a, it's a, yeah. nice little, a nice little totally. philosophical bait and switch. Um, totally. The exact kind of bait and switch that is revealing, right? Right, exactly. Of its true topic. Yes. It's like... It's true aboutness. Yeah, it's that little turn yeah. of like if you're in the dream, right? Like... That's right. Little, what about that over there? About that over there? Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. What is the dream really about? What is the, yes. sto what is the proper story of the dream? Yes. Yeah. Yet it took nearly another 10 years before I was able to say what I was thinking. The fitting word is still lacking even today. The prospect of the thinking that labors to answer to the nature of language is still veiled in all its vastness. This is why I do not yet see whether what I am trying to think of as the nature of language is also adequate for the nature of the Eastern language. Whether in the end, which would also be the beginning a nature of language can reach the thinking experience, a nature which would also, would offer the reassure, the re, the, 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 I'm sorry, would offer the assurance that European or Western saying and Eastern saying will enter into dialogue such that in it, they're seeing something that wells up from a single source. There sings something that wells up from a single source. Right. Yeah. That sounds like the melody of the Geist that we often talk about. Totally. The melody of the Geist that emerges from the pool of right. Dialogos when the splashing participants turn still, right? Yeah. 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 But a source that would then still remain concealed from both language worlds. That is what I mean. This is why your visit is especially welcome to me. Since you have already translated into Japanese a few of Kleist's plays and some of my lectures on Holdren, you have a keener ear for the questions that I address to your compatriots almost 35 years ago. You must not overestimate my abilities, especially since I, coming from Japanese poetry, still find it difficult to respond to European poetry in a way that does justice to its essential nature. Even though the danger remains that it necessarily implies in our using the German language for our dialogue, I believe that I have meanwhile learned a little more so that now I can ask questions better than several decades ago. At the time, at that time, my compatriots' dialogues with you after class were taking a different direction. Therefore, I now ask you, what prompted the Japanese professors and later, in particular, Count Kuki, to give special attention to that transcript. I can report only of Kuki's explanations. They never did become fully clear to me, for in characterizing your manner of thinking, he often invoked the terms hermeneutics or hermeneutic. As far as I can remember, I first used those words in a, in, a, in a later course in the summer of 1923. 
that was the time when I began my first drafts of being in time. In our judgment, Count Cookie did not succeed in explaining the terms satisfactorily, neither concerning the meaning of the word, nor regarding the sense in which you were speaking of a hermeneutic phenomenology. Cookie merely stressed constantly that the term was to indicate a new direction of phenomenology. It may indeed have looked that way. In fact, however, I was concerned neither with a direction in phenomenology nor, indeed, with anything new. Quite the reverse. I was trying to think the nature of phenomenology in a more originary manner so as to fit it in this way back into the place that is proper, it's, it, which is properly its own within Western philosophy. So something I just want to point out here, so like this struck, this struck me. Um, indeed, I knew quite the reverse. I was trying to think the nature of phenomenology. So again, he, does, he, he doesn't say think about, mm -hmm. right? But to think it, mm -hmm. right? So there's something I think I'm, there's something I, you know, if we look at the difference between when I say think about the nature of phenomenology or th like think differently or something, right? Think about it differently. If I remove the about and I say think phenomenology, right? Um, more originally or something. What am I, what is the, what do you hear is the indication between the difference between thinking about something and thinking it? I think one, so what strikes me intuitively is that one, one is a form of gnosis and one is not. Hmm. Um, right. So hmm. I think of the Platonian quote, right? The organ, um, knowing is the organ fitted to the object, right? When hmm. they share identity, hmm. when they share identity, that's what we mean by gnosis. Yeah. So the, the, the relation to the nature of phenomenology. No, no. What am I trying to say? The nature, the nature of the relation between his thinking and phenomenology is a relation that he aspired to be one of gnosis. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So there's a, this way in which to think the nature of phenomenology versus think about it. The, the about seems to have phenomenology already kind of assumed as something, right? Upon which my thinking, which would kind of think about it as if it could somehow stay the same without thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Like phenomenology can stay there and thinking can stay there. And if they meet and discuss each other, they'll, they'll or not, they'll still be the same. Mm -hmm. So I think what he's saying is like, to think it more originally, right? To, which is, has to do with origin, right? To think it from origin, right? Yeah. So in some way, there's this, it, and it's interesting. Why, I'm, why I think why this is this is speaking to me is I'm I'm uh, I've been reading something by Johannes's teacher, who's you know uh, he's a Heide he's a Heideggerian scholar, and it, and we're talking we're, he's going through um, Heraclitus and breaking down the Heraclitus language in this very original way. But I'm noticing like the experience feels like I start, I start the sentence and it just seems normal. Like, okay, I'm understanding, I'm understanding. And then by the end of the sentence, I've somehow, I'm a different person. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. That's right. Because, right. Yeah. 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 Because there's, there's a, because somehow the speaking becomes something of necessity that transforms you in its likeness into its likeness. Yes. That's, yeah. that's yeah. it. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. It's like you're, it's like you're affiliated by it. Mm -hmm. right. right. It's like you become, you become,
become you become it a species of it. Right, right. And this is also interesting because reading, I would say that in some ways reading is a lot more like listening than listening is, right? Hmm. Because on some level, that's interesting. Because reading is like reading is like overhearing. I've been thinking about that term. Except you supply the voice to yeah. the author that, that to be yeah, overheard. Yeah. And, so, and so what you're hearing is of yourself and not of yourself simultaneously. Yeah. 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 Which, Which is, is just key. really interesting. But I also think it's like very much the same thing in dialogue because it's the same thing. Well, it's the same thing with reading, even more so with reading. Whereas if you have a thought right and you veer away from while you're listening to me you, you you'll notice that you hadn't heard me right but the moment you stop thinking is to return to listening yeah so this wedded relationship right between thought and listening right yeah uh are one to are like really one to one so on some level when we say to think something on some level it's to be deeply obedient to its origin right like, and some level to think it fully is to think it as if it was being funk the first time, right? There's, there's an obedience, like, because I know hearkening is related to obedience in a, mm -hmm. and so, and so listening, right? right. There's this kind of ob yes. So there's Hark. this obedience and that goes back to the thing that you were talking about with, with, um, gnosis of yes. like, oh, to Oh, to listen is to become fitted to the organ of the object that you're becoming. And that is that transformation and just mutual disclosure. Yeah. Probably what he's it, talking about. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of like, I mean, not to get too mystical about it, but it's kind of like a hype. It's like, it's like, it's like the kind of the hypost the hypostatic redevouring that Plotinus talks about. Right, mm. that all mm. things eventually are. It's, it's in the way that all things are redevoured mm. by by the one when when they advert themselves to it. Right, right, right. When when right when the when the child adverts to its parent properly, yeah. it calls itself to the presence of its parent. Right, and is redevoured by it. Yeah. Right. So when we hear ourselves as spoken, mm. we hearken to the originating speech, something like that. That's why it really matters who you hang out with. Oh, does it ever? Right? It's a matter of, it's, it's a matter of deepest necessity. Yeah. It actually is. Yeah. Matter of deepest, deepest necessity, who you, what company you keep. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a divine and existential choice. Right. Who do I want to yeah. be devoured by? Totally. Right. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Okay. Who's going to, whose listening ear is going to tune me to hearken to the deepest form of the logos yeah. that I can access, right? Yeah. By whose ear do I want to listen? I think that's it. I think right. that's it. It's by whose ear do I want to listen? Right. That's why I like talking to you, right? Like, yeah. Because, because when I listen by your ear, like the boundaries of the world retreat away instantly. Yeah. It becomes deeper. It becomes its, right. its flesh becomes far more permeable. Right. Um, immediately. And then, so right? thus, thus when you say what you hear by my ear, I hear myself, right. In a way that I, I couldn't just by myself somehow. Like, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. But then that ear, right? We can, as we know, we can then interject to that ear, right, right, and and keep it, keep the the dialogic matrix by which that ear is heard through, to keep that intact and to keep that revolving, right. Even when we're not actually, you know, in actuality doing it. And I get the sense in this in this dialogue, like on some level. I mean, Heidegger keeps kind of standing something up and then kicking it away, right? On every level of like what he, both, both of what he's currently saying, but also what he has says, including what he thought at that time that he was doing. He keeps standing something up and 
kicking it out, standing it up and kicking it out. Yeah. Right. It, yet, yet there's something present, like at least in this, there's something gathering in this, yeah. right? Like there's yeah. a world on some level that yeah. I can, I can sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's like, it keeps pollulating. It keeps, it keeps, it, it, it erupts and then it's almost like he retracts it back. It erupts yeah. and he retracts it back. Cause he's trying to, it's like, it's like a, it's like an exercise in optimal gripping, I think yeah. in a way. Yeah. Right. Interesting. He's trying to grip the aboutness of the dialogue right. through the dialogue. And so the dialogue is tuning itself as it, as it, as it, as it advances in the direction about which it speaks. And it seems like the optimal grip is to recognize its non-optimal grip, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, right. Like it's this. Right, right. Yeah. Well, because the, yeah, the, the grip has to be, the, 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 the faulty grip has to be disillusioned of its, dis, disillusioned of its mastery before it deigns yeah. to grip again, right? Yeah, right. Cause, cause yeah, cause there's a way it's interesting cause th there's a way when it reveals it's non-optimal grip, that very revealing is disclosing the thing that you can then grip. It's like, it's, it's saying not the right grip discloses more of the right grip. Right. Yeah. And the more it does that, right. You kind of get this sense of, yeah, totally. All yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. I think I think we're. Uh, but why did you use the term? I think that's you, um, Japanese. Ah, okay. But why did you use the term hermeneutic? The answer is given in the introduction to being in time, section seven C, page blah 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 fifty eight. But I will gladly add a few remarks to dispel the illusion that the use of the term is accidental. I recall that it was this illusion which caused objections. The term hermeneutics, hermeneutics was familiar to me from my theological studies. At that time, I was particularly agitated over the question of the relation between the the word of holy scripture and theological speculative thinking. This relation between language and being was the same one, if you will, only it was veiled and inaccessible to me so that through my deviation and false starts, I sought in vain for a guiding thread. I know too little of Christian theology to comprehend what you refer to, but it is obvious that through your background and your studies, you are at home in theology in a manner totally different from those who come from outside and merely pick up through reading a few things that belong in that area. Without this theological background, I should never have come upon the path of thinking. But origin always comes to meet us from the future. Oh, interesting. Oh, take that line again. Yeah. Without this theological background, I should never have come upon the path of thinking. But origin always comes to meet us from the future. Mm. That's like, that's, yeah, that's like prolepsis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the two call to each other and reflection makes its home within that calling and thus becomes true presence later on, I meet the term hermeneutics again in Wilhelm Dilthey in his theory of the history of ideas. Dilthey's familiarity with hermeneutics came from that same source, his theological studies, and especially his work on um, Schleimmaker. 
you know, you were saying something is coming to mind, right? Where isn't it, we were talking about how there's like the, the Greek, the ancient Greek notion of the logos is the gathering. And then there's mm -hmm. the, the, the um, Hebraic notion of the, the proclaiming word, right? Or yeah. the, yep. the word of creation. The effective word. Yeah. Yeah. And then you said, and Christianity on some level is the, is the, is the marriage of the two. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing that uh, 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 Thorleif Bowman points out is that in many ways when, when the word, like the, the word that descends in the Holy spirit is a yeah. word combined of the gathering, the gathering and arranging unity of the Greeks and the poesis of the Hebrews. Right. Something like that. Right. So it's just interesting to think about like, okay, so Heidegger is the origin speaks from the, <laughs> from the future this having to do with the hermeneutic sense of reading the Bible, right? I'm just, I, I'm just kind of seeing mm, if anything mm. pulls on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hi, there is something. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I think that's it, all I have to say. Yes. Yeah. It's like, this is kind of sense of like unclothing, right? Yeah. Like there, in in some strange way, that's the thing. Well, that's the thing. My understanding of or actually Herbianetics in the Gadmerian sense, right? Who is a student of Heidegger? I I mean, and this is probably a, a way oversimplified summary, but I think what like he had this the sense of that it, you know on at some level, if you look at Herbianetics, is trying to find like trying to figure out what the original author meant by his utterance, right? What you found is that, what they found out is that you couldn't actually do it. In other mm -hmm. words, you couldn't not bring back your, like you couldn't bring your own frame of, you couldn't not bring your own frame of reference, even in mm -hmm. just get, getting rid of it. Yeah. And he yeah. says on, on that level, from that level, people looked at that and said, ah, oh, see, you can't do it, it's a failure. But Right. But Gadamer points out, like, no, that's exactly how history is made. That's right. Is that you? That's right. Is that you look back, right? In so, in some sense, from the history's position, from the you cut out for me, guy. Can't hear you anymore. Still, still can't. I guess I should make sure that it's not my problem. No, yeah. No. Yeah, so there, there's, you know, there's something about this di this kind of dialogue with um, that history and the moment, actually the creative movement of history itself, right, is precisely in its looking back, having, not being able to, like, it won't re release its frame, but it, but it, that's how you create the past. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because like philosophical insights, well, e personal insights too, always have that quality I've noticed is that when it's an insight, right, usually there's, well, you know, like this, the, the sixth sense, right. Um, he's dead through the movie. No one knows it. And then at the end of the movie, you're like, he sees it out of the corner of his eye. It's like, whoa. And the, you recognize he's dead. But the mm -hmm. moment you recognize it, it goes back to the very beginning of the movie to all the main and remakes and remakes the world. Yes. And it was, yeah. it was obvious. It was obvious the whole time, but undistinct. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so come into distinction. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's something about multiple levels in which this is what they're talking about, I think is revealing itself through the, through what's being said and also through the way it's going about back and forth it being said. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I, I mean, I think that that precise, that is and is not, that precise dialectical tension that you're talking about, I think is what um, 
what John's been trying to put his finger on with inventio as a term, right? The simultaneous mm-hmm. discovery and creation. Yeah. Right. It's that, 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 that concept, um, that, that concept, um, is, um, has, has, has something very much to do with contracting the, the hermeneutic circle, right? Yes. It's the, it's the effective word that brings about that which that which already was and yet was and yet was not to our sight or something like that. Seems like the word isn't that isn't that spoken through the word inception? To invent, which word? Like, so when you realize or you reveal and both create in your revealing. Right. Oh, like the incepting of an idea. Yeah. The idea, like the, the incepting of an idea that brings yeah. it forth into being. Yeah. Yeah. Inception, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There's something there for sure. All right. So we are. Okay. I'm okay. Hermeneutic. So you are. Okay. Let me just, I'll start from the top right here. Um, It developed first and formally in conjunction with the interpretation of the book of books, the Bible. There is a lecture by Schleemaker that a a published, that was published posthumously by his manuscripts under the title Hermeneutics and Criticism with special reference to the New Testament. I have it here and shall read you the first two sentences from the German introduction. And here's the German introduction. Hermeneutics and criticism, both philological um, disciplines, both mythologies belong together because the practice of each presupposes the other. The first is in general the art of understanding, rightly another man's language, particularly his written language. The second, the art of judging rightly the genuineness of written works and passages and to establish it on the strength of adequate evidence and data. Accordingly, the word hermeneutics, broadened in the appropriate sense, can mean the theory and methodology for every kind of interpretation, including, for example, that of works of the visual arts. Quite. Do you use the term in this broad sense? If I may say, within the style of your question, I have to answer. In being in time, the term hermeneutics is used in a still broader sense. Broader here meaning, however, not the mere extension of the same meaning over still larger area of application. Broader is to say, in keeping with that vastness, in keeping with that vastness, which springs from the originary being, Mm. Keeping, I'm going to say that again. Okay, so this seems important. The inexhaustible. Broader here meaning, however, not the mere extension of the same meaning over still larger area of application. Broader is to say a keeping with the vastness which springs from originary being. In being in time, hermeneutics means neither the theory of the art of interpretation nor interpretation itself, but rather the attempt, the attempt first of all to define the nature of interpretation on hermeneutic grounds. Yeah, take a second with that one. Yeah. Like I, as you took, you, you breathe it in. I'm just waiting to see if there's an exhale.
But what does hermeneutic, what does hermeneutic mean then? I do not have the audacity to yield to the suspicion which here suggests itself that you are now using the word hermeneutic willfully. Be that as it may, what matters to me is to hear from your own lips and, if I may say so, authentic explanation of your use of the word. Otherwise, it will still not become clear what moved Count Kuki's reflections. So it's just interesting that we're, st we're still trying to get clear on Count Kuki's reflections about Heidegger's, what Heidegger meant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I do not understand Socrates. Right, totally, exactly. All right, I shall be glad to do as you ask. Only do not expect too much, for the matter is enigmatic, and perhaps we are not dealing with a matter at all. Perhaps rather with a process. Or with what is the case, all hyphens, what or with what is the case. <laughs> But much, but such terms will click, quickly land us in inadequacies. I want to know what the German word for what is the case is. Right. Yeah. Um, but only if we already somehow have in view what our saying would want to reach. Hmm. Could you say that again? Read that one again. But only if we already somehow have in view what our saying would want to reach. It can hardly have escaped you that in my later writings, I no longer employ the term hermeneutics. You are said to have changed your standpoint. <laughs> standpoint. Think about yes. that word for a second, right? Yeah. Right? The logos of a given proposal creates a standpoint from which to view. Mm -hmm. And he's saying here, the, uh, the, the, the Japanese conversation partner, but if we only, but if, but if only we already somehow have in view from our standpoint, what our saying would want to reach. And yet the saying, the saying is creative of the standpoint. Yes. Right. Or, or perhaps more precisely the hearing of the saying. Yeah. The, the, the hearkening of the saying is constitutive of the standpoint, right? right? And yes. that's why the saying, that's why the saying is creative of the world. Right. That provides a view to, to the world beyond the world, if we can right. say, say that, right? Exactly. Right. Because um, of the saying. So every, they're changing virtue. their standpoints constantly, right? Yeah, totally. They, yeah. Yeah, it's like that thing, it keeps knocking itself down stands up on it, proposes that which it stands on to its herd beyond its own stand, which creates a new, it, <laughs> it knocks that one off and puts you on a new stand. That's right? right, yeah, like the plinth or the footstool, Yeah. right? The proposition being the footstool from which yeah. to gain the tychoscopic view. Yeah. Um, and and that's that's the that's the that's certainly the very Socratic um, view of the word I would yeah. say oh, yeah. that Heidegger seems to be teasing out, but his yeah. uh, his poor interlocutor isn't quite right. Isn't right. is is exemplifying it without cottoning to it? Yes. I think you said um... you are said to have changed your standpoint. Mm. I have left an earlier standpoint, <laughs> not in order to exchange it for another one, but because even the former standpoint was merely a way station along the way. The lasting element in thinking is the way and ways of thinking hold within them 
that mysterious quality is the mornis right? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as ways of thinking hold within them that mysterious quality that we can we can walk them forward and backward <laughs> and that indeed only the way back will lead us forward mm-hmm. Obviously, you do not mean forward in the sense of an advance, but I have difficulty in finding the right word. (laughs) Exactly the point. (laughs) (laughs) For, into, that nearest nearness. For, into, that nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of and which strikes us as strange each time anew when we catch sight of it. Mm. I'm gonna take that again, guys. So four, into that nearest nearness, which we constantly rush rush ahead of. That nearest nearest, that nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of, and which strikes us as strange each time anew when we catch sight of it. It strikes me that, Mm -hmm. that he's just given. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that that is suchness. Mm. Mm. The nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of, and which strikes us as strange each time anew when we catch sight of it. I think that's what that is. Yeah. I think that's that's what that that is. I think that's the suchness. The catching it anew in, in catching sight of it right? On some level, what you caught is, we'll say, the suchness of you as it, as it beams through your face. Mm-hmm. The, the face, what I see is not changed, but what animates it animates the nature of, of what I was already looking at but not seeing, mm. right? The suchness, right? Yeah. Suchness, yeah. Interesting. Okay. That nearest, yeah, I, I love that. That that's a beautiful turn of phrase. The nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of, because there's a way in which that right, the what we keep talking about, also with John, that that somehow the the moreness, and you and you and you pinned it before because you were reading something that mysterious quality we can walk that thinking of hope. Okay. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. I want to. I want to take it's two, okay, two of these. Pa- two, I want to take. I want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it does. I think I just fall down though. Um, <laughs> when I try and go forwards and backwards, I just trip. Yeah, yeah. So there's these two passages. So I want to take one, mm-hmm. uh, just slightly above that you just read, and then you stopped as you read it because you 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 detected the moreness. So the lasting element is thinking is the way, and ways of thinking hold within them the mysterious quality. That mysterious quality that we can walk them forward and backward. The the mysterious quality is that we can walk them forward and backward. Okay. Mm-hmm. And you said, oh, that's like the moreness, which I think yeah. was, it's intuitively right. Yeah. So then, so then the, that quality, that mysterious quality that we can walk them forward and backward. Right. And then, and then let's take the nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of right. as the suchness. Right. And there's a way in which the moreness, the moreness becomes knowable. Well, The moreness becomes available, shall we say, mm-hmm. only from within the sight of suchness. Yeah. And so if we were to transcribe that into the language of these passages, it would be, and this is just, I'm just playing with this. I have yeah, no idea yeah. what this, what, what this lands at or not, but yeah. the, the, the mysterious quality that we can walk mm-hmm the mysterious quality that we can walk ways of thinking forward and back that they are, that they remain, that they remain suggestible by the necessities of being is a 
mysterious quality that we can only cotton to from that nearest nearness, which we constantly rush ahead of, and which strikes us as strange each time anew when we catch sight of it. So the knowing of the four, that nearest nearness, allows us a view into that mysterious quality that we can walk our thinking forward and backward. Right. Which, which we constantly rush ahead of. Which that which we constantly good. rush ahead of is precisely what calls to presence that quality that we can walk our thinking forward yeah. and backward. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That the, the espousal of the, the espousal of the standpoint as such yeah. is what gives us a view to its yeah. more. Right. Right. And there's something that happens in taking the view, right? There's some way in which in taking the view, we already rush ahead of it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's already more mm -hmm. than its proposition. And, and it is that is that as we as we rush ahead into the moreness, right? Um, there's a, here's this forward and backward thing of like the way. There's something about like the yeah, uh huh. I was just I had just an image called to mind. It's in many ways it's a very obvious image because it involves the the canopy, but it's. Mm -hmm. You know how when you're when you're actually, this is just a visual metaphor, but to me it says something. It it's like you know how when you're actually in motion, when you're walking, mm -hmm. when you're rushing ahead of your nearest nearness, such mm -hmm. that it no longer becomes your nearest nearness, right? When you're in motion, mm -hmm. ambulating around, mm -hmm. you know, on a walk, you can't. Let's say it's at night and you want to get a look at the stars. Yeah. We want to get a good look at the stars, like not yeah. a glance. You want to actually look at the stars such that you feel enveloped by the canopy, which only actually happens if you stop, plant yourself. Right. Usually you have to actually lie down on your back to get a really, yeah. really good survey, yeah. right? Yeah. But it actually requires, again, think about this idea of the nearest nearness. You actually have to assume your nearest nearness. You have to assume the identity of your nearest nearness. I'm thinking of literally the ground beneath your feet. Right, yes. You have to assume the identity of the nearest near, near yeah. You have to assume the identity of the nearest nearness. Yeah. As it were the ground beneath your feet right. in order to gain a view to the moreness, which is already, which is always already overlooking mm. whatever it is you're near yeah yeah right so imagine you you have to lie on the ground in order to gain a view to the cosmos right right, right? doing it as you're walking doesn't work you can't yeah. do it yeah. right i mean and then yeah. you become like uh you become like thales and you like fall into a ditch i think it right. was it was wasn't it thales who fell into a ditch i think it was yeah, yeah. um you become like Thales, you fall into a ditch. If you try and gain, you, when you try and gain perspective on the more mm -hmm. without assuming the identity of such mm -hmm. and knowing it, again, knowing it as gnosis, sharing in its identity, without sharing in the identity of such, you can't actually gain a view to more. Right. So, the, yeah. so there's also this quality, like it, it, it strikes me as, you know, and... The, the ancient way of being oriented is precisely looking at the stars. But like, but once you get situated with the stars, it tells you where you are so that you can look right where you are. Because if, you don't, if you're not oriented, you don't know what you're looking at. You aren't anywhere. That's right. right? That's right. That's right. So it, it returns, it returns it returns to situate the, so the, the view to the more returns to situate yourself as yes. such. Yes. Right. That's right. Totally. Your nearest nearness. Right. Orients. It becomes place properly yeah. only 
as beholden and overlooked and yeah. overheard yeah. by the mornus against right. into which it into which it echoes and, and against which it um right. it is distinguished yes yes and then there's something about so now what presupposes my orienting and even needing the stars is that i'm going somewhere right and now there's a, there's a going somewhere that i've been before right but then there's going to somewhere where i've not been before right for which actually i'm more apt to orient myself into the stars because it, think about it, it's like, how do I know to go somewhere where I haven't been before? In what way is it already present, right? To even, to prehend, to prehend knowing about it, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's something about in that prehension, right? Um, Cause this is, it's interesting. Nice. This is, this is nice. like, this is precisely why I think I was listening to, you know, it's funny is trying to, is listening to a group of um, hacker um, programmers try to try to encode this thing that they can't, they can't get it, the code to do, which is how do you get the computer to represent not knowing what it doesn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or, but, 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 but also not knowing, but even more than that, which all that seems to be predicated on in some levels, how do you get it to represent the domain of that you know, that you don't know, right? What you don't know, right? There's like a, there's like a, a level of negation that's, that's, that's the big, I mean, that seems to be the big I mystery. Just got vertigo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on some level, when we walk outside, there is the domain. In fact, on some level, it's got to be the most orienting horizon, I think, if it's a horizon. Because um, there's the domain that like, I can plan for, and then I can plan for the things that I don't know about, but I can anticipate. But mm -hmm. then there's the, the then there's that sense which I can't even plan for, but I know it's there. Question is, is how do I represent it to myself, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that I think it's maybe what the, the moreness is, right? Is like it's the moreness is I have access somehow to, right? That there's a beyond that's disclosed itself as such, as somehow making present the prehensions upon which I would, I would, I know to explore the exploration of which would be the, is the future development of my own character of my own suchness. Right, 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 right. It's like, so then the use of the word qua language yeah is like the call and the call and response and the response mm -hmm. of the such into the more is always the such against the more yeah. in virtue of which it becomes itself yeah. and becomes more right right becomes it's be becoming itself properly and dialectically is becoming both itself as such yeah. and itself as more but only when raised against the canopy of moreness, if we can put right. it that way. Right. right. Only when raised against the canopy of moreness and silhouette does the... Yes. Well, if, if we could even talk about the self this way, right? Does the self as such... Uh-huh. Is the self as such revealed in its moreness? Yeah. And the, the logos. Right. You know, it's funny. I thought about this. Funny enough, this is like, uh, I think I thought about this either while I was stoned or after I was done being stoned or something like that when I used to get stoned a lot. Um, was like that there's that experience of, you know, like of, of being stoned, which I think is where you have that thought, right? That as you go along, right? Like you're having the most profound thought 
And then at some point you go to reference back what you were thinking about to bring it all together and it's gone. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. There's that kind of quality of like, and I, and I, I likened it to this is like that somehow normally, right. When we have a thought the the our axioms, the presuppositions that, 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 that a lot that makes possible for that thought to ha- be a thought follows the thought. Usually it trails mm-hmm. along behind. And maybe something like when you're stoned or whatever, that it somehow allows thought to move forward, right? To move forward and backward in the way yeah. that Heidegger's described. Yes, and ahead of it's beyond, like like a couple of things, like beyond, away from its own axioms. And yeah. the further away it gets from its own axioms, the more um, luminous, right, and other, right, it's yeah. going to become right. Beautiful and at, point. At some yeah. point, it's interesting. Inter- oh my God! And it's going to be like this. And at some point, you have to actually look back. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, like, if it, if you look back, and you can't remember, then it goes. You're back. Right. Back. And you're axioms, That's right. And you're just stoned. Right. That's but right. That's like, right. Maybe enlightenment is this: is it pulls forward, and then you look back, and instead of it sucking you back, and you're stoned it somehow pulls forward the axioms pull forward yes or it or or it spatializes the tension yes yes in the distance yes in the distance traveled which would be analogous to something like i was thinking the axioms you get a new background that's given by the foreground that's not the same axioms that's right that's right that's oh that's a beautiful point guy that's so insightful that and that, and that well, that's and that's part of why people pursue altered states of, of consciousness. Speaking just phenomenologically, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. because the turning of the foreground into the background, the trans the 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 way that the way that the transparency opacity shifting seems to equilibrate in altered mm-hmm. states of consciousness is such that it they they balance in such a way that they bec- it becomes the world the 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 word and by the word I mean the particular logos mm-hmm. of the thinking. The logos of the thinking that constitutes the frame of your experience in the right. span of a moment right. has the quality of translucence such that you're, that the thinking as the thought occurs to you, the thought becomes the frame in virtue of which the world presents to you. The whole world takes on the salience of a particular mode or form of life determined by the logos of that originating thought. Right. So that's why, you know, when people are, whether, whether, you know, stoned or whatnot, that, 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 um, um, a, I don't know, thinking cold seems to affect cold. Mm. Mm. Right. Mm. Or, or, or bring like that, 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 that uh, the occurrence of the thought is an invocating manna that mm. calls into presence it's referent and it calls it into presence more acutely than I think a lot of people feel in their regular sober states so that the foreground of the thought turns into the background of the world seamlessly. Yes. Right. Totally. And that's why that, I mean, and that's why it's so phenomenally, I mean, that's why it's so, it's so, um, that's why those states, that's part of, there's a lot of reasons, right? But that's part of why those states are so phenomenally attractive is because they bring to present a form of symbolic knowing, yeah. which is not to say that for those forms of symbolic knowing are somehow dependent upon those states or that those states are of necessity. Cause I don't, yeah. I don't think that's true necessarily, uh-huh. but, but they are a way of understanding something. the body of symbolic thinking and its translucence, because you can understand how the foreground of the word becomes the background of the world, and the 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 tonas of the relation between the word as spoken and the world as realized and lived seems to tighten. I think in those yeah. states, in that state of translucence yeah. between transparency and opacity. Now it's a delicate thing, right? Because I mean, just as, just as waking within a dream and trying to cultivate and hold together a lucid state within a dream is a very delicate thing. And it's lost in a second, right? It's lost in a second. Um, 
right? Like the flow state, because yeah. it is a flow state, right? It's yeah. lost. It's as soon as you become um, overly conscious of it, um, it it slips. It slips. So you have to. It's like you have to. You have to yes. maintain an optimal form of consciousness such that you're attentive, right. without being, without objectifying. Yes, totally. Right, because it's a transjective totally. yeah, state. Anyway, when you when you talked about sort of the the foregrounding and the backgrounding and the the relation between those two, yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's a great insight. It's coming to mind. I'm glad we're recording this. There's like a lot of stuff that I'm probably going to steal from my my writing. Um, <laughs> Not if I steal it first. <laughs> yes, totally. <laughs> I'll turn off the. You can't transcripts. <laughs> <laughs> but the. Uh, um, but I was thinking about like, so, so I think maybe this is what Goethe was getting at. Are you familiar at all with Goethe's science, his, episto- his, his scientific work? I'm not. Oh yeah, he was like into botany and all kinds of things. Basically, some people credit to him of doing a different science. Goethe was that, that was a different Those that, polymaths drive me crazy. I mean, just he's, <laughs> just, the, he's the archetype Just of hate that. him. Just right? hate him. But one of the things he did is he is he he somehow and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna probably not say this correctly, but something in the ballpark of he said he he said that so we we can read like man made objects right cultural objects because we have the corollary concept right that. Um, that allows us to instead of seeing the desk right instead instead of seeing a bunch of wood and a bunch of shapes we see a desk we're able to read it so the like the the object is more like the letter in which we read right mm-hmm. and the, because we behold on some level the 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 corollary concept right that allows us to to have the the sh- the, the the material become transparent right mm-hmm. to that thing and he, and he said, and this way it was really interesting. He's like, but when we look at nature, we don't know how to read it. Wow. We don't read it. And he says that science tries to understand the text of nature by measuring the shape of the letters. But he, he I think he was seeking to, 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 to think the logos of nature. Oh, wow. Right? Through this process of intense observation in a certain way where he wanted to think the species, right? To read that, the logo, right? To read it yeah. in through mind. He had this whole way of, of doing that and tracking it and this whole thing. And there's right. something here about like this notion of salience of that in being able to somehow see even the beginnings of looking at your, like looking at your, um, your world, your arena, right? And this way of being able to begin to read something like the eternal in more and more of the arena, right? But- Oh, yeah. And it's actually like that. And that's usually the sign that you know when something's transformed for somebody. It's right. It's not this sense of this, it's not usually the sense of like, I'm my subjectivity strikes me as different it's more like the world says something different my mother occurs for me different i noticed myself responding to a world that what that i that i responded to completely differently last week that now right the sense of see reading the world as the logo says in the earth itself or in the world right it's a shamanic it's a shamanic exercise yeah yeah. It's the proto shamanic exercise, isn't it? Right. Yes. Of yes. of 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 when the form of life, when the logo says the form of life of the world becomes imit- imitable within yes. within your subjectivity. Yeah. Um. Then it's like you extend the scope of your. It's like extending the scope of your Dasein in some sense, isn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Totally. That's what that's yeah, and and that's why, I mean that's why those mimetic rituals, that's why those mimetic transformations and performances are so crucial, right? The symbolic performance of 
of, of imitating the tiger or imitating the bird yeah. in its flight or that kind of like those, again, those, all those proto shamanic exercises that we still have yes. affected in our culture to some degree, mm-hmm. um, affect those precise changes. Well, isn't um, that kind of what Corbin was in some senses, kind of, I, I always got the sense with Corbin that he, like if you were to fully realize the talos of his work, it'd be something like, if it was fully realized, how you would know is that the, all the world would occur as an icon, right? Yeah. Every, everything has that translucence we were talking yeah. about. Everything, yes. everything is an aperture through which, through which moreness shines and suchness reaches. Right. Right. Something like that, I think. Right. Yes. Everything is, sim- every, his sense symb- iconic. We, we, I think we're, I'm certainly more accustomed to using the word symbolic, but to mean yeah. very much the same thing. Yeah. Right. That, that, that the, that the, that the boundaries of the canopy become permeable again in such a way that, um, that, that everything becomes a basis for seeing. Everything becomes a standpoint from which yeah. to know, but, but realized first as a standpoint mm-hmm. and then secondarily as any kind of object. Yes. Yes. And there's right? the and prehension, that, right? There's totally. the prehension. Yeah. There's the prehension. And that, and that's, and that's, it, that's the way in which propositions, right? In the Socratic tradition, if we want to draw it all the way back to Socrates, yeah. that every proposition in the Socratic tradition is a standpoint from which to see and know. And, and, and it is that, it is that first, every, every, mm. the, every uttered logos of knowing is its meaning of meaning rather than its meaning. Because every every the logos of every proposition reaches to its parent logos, reaches right. to the source, to the source that calls it huh. to attention. And there's the way. There's that kind there's of a the long yeah, there's yeah. that elongating stretch, right? Yeah. It's interesting. This is there is this kind of like, yeah. And that seems to be well, also the way of wisdom, this sense of like, how do you start to become more wise <laughs> when you can't possess wisdom? It's like, well, it more informs the way that even your mistake in your not knowing is somehow the way in which will disclose itself in the beginning, in the back, and that somehow that it allows this, the landscape to come to salience in precisely the thing that it's that you don't have <laughs> it's weird right right right, right. yeah right. exactly exactly yeah. and then and then the and then the the logos the organization of any given proposal any given form of speech becomes part of the way insofar as it becomes in the way heidegger means it here a way station right Right. It becomes a way, a, a, yeah, it becomes a, a way, a way station on the quest for its, yeah, its higher order, its meta meaning becomes yeah. a way station on the quest of its meta meaning. It's so interesting. I'm kind of hearing John in the background, wondering if he's like, if what he's would say is like, well, we're talking about relevance realization, aren't we? Yes, he would say that. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah, because that would be that would be it. It's because what you're realizing is the the relevance ends up being the all, the whole, as revealed in what's most relevant. So what is most salient is also what's most relevant, right? That's right. And that's the that's right. Right. The closer and closer and closer and closer. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And then each offering, each offering um, is simply a, a, a meaning that provisions for more. So interesting. And, and, and he would certainly apply the, 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 the relevance realizations, I think quite rightly to that. Yeah. Cause yeah. it's so interesting because you can also, so interesting to think about this because there's a way that there's an allness to something like ideological possession that's like it's it's interesting it's very similar right 
but in this, uh, but it's completely upside down, right? Of this trickery, right? Of utter salience of what's saturated mm -hmm. is obvious that discloses a standpoint which becomes self-referential through making what is most real, not what's most salience, confirming itself, becoming ever, ever, ever more predictable, yet enclosed in. And the moment it closes in is the moment it starts becoming brittle, exactly. right? Like yes, needing exactly. more and more standpoint. And then you'll, yeah. Exactly. So you're just a flaging, exactly. a flaging like, like foaming, like froth of fighting for and against everybody. <laughs> Hyper morality of some kind. That's right. right. That's right. No, no, no. But, but when, when, the stand, when the standpoint as such becomes confused with the moreness it beholds yeah. and thus loses the tension yes. with the moreness that envelops it and gives it its situation, then the traveler along the path has lost the path, right? The way station has lost the way when it has confused itself for, you know, yeah. the Tower of Babel or something like right. that, right? Right, um, totally. And, and, and its view to the heavens, mm. the ground upon which its view to the heavens is gained becomes mistaken for the heavens it views. Yeah, interesting. And that I think is, as you say, ideology yeah in some sense yeah oh, yeah so interesting yeah very interesting this is great i i'm i think i met my i met my neurological capac capacity <laughs> without unless i, I thought it was at mind like two hours ago but here we are yeah. just uh you gave Absolutely. me uh, en energy i didn't know i had you always fantastic. do fantastic fantastic mutual my friend all so right. we got we got pretty far into heidegger not bad not bad at all. We'll pick Not it back up. All. We'll pick it we, back up next week or something just, like that. Yeah. It's all about the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my friend. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Guys.